So when we talk about microevolution, these are small changes, right? I don't want to look at speciation events yet. I want to look at what changes allele frequencies or allele concentrations, if you want, in a population. There are five major things that work on microevolution. Mutations, gene flow, genetic drift, non-random mating, and natural selection. Let's look at these individually. So a mutation can be anything, right? It can be random, um, and it often is. So when we look at mutations, they can be random just through DNA replication errors. Or we can look at induced mutations, which means you've been exposed to something in your environment usually that causes mutations. But regardless, mutations can be very good. The problem is they often are completely neutral, meaning that you have no idea that they've even occurred. So this rate is actually very low for mutations having an effect, but they do create new alleles in some cases. This is good. This is increasing variability. That's wonderful, okay? Some mutations will be deadly, but very few will actually benefit our population. These are the ones that we would actually be interested in, the ones that benefit our population. They're the ones that are going to drive evolution, but they're very few and far between. Gene flow, as we mentioned, is the movement of alleles from one population to another. Now, just to think about the movement of alleles is a little weird. So think about the movement of either individuals as a whole or the movement of gametes. So if you're looking at something that's wind pollinated, you could look at the movement of pollen between populations, right? Sure. So the idea of gene flow certainly can alter frequencies in a population because we get a lot of interaction between populations. There aren't hard, fast lines. Think about the fact that in, say, the 1300s, you finding a mate in Siberia would be difficult if you lived in Rochester, right? But now, you could meet someone in Siberia walking down the hallway today, right? So this idea of gene flow and movement of alleles between populations is really common. I give you an example here of, of plants that can interact, and when they do, when this pollen spreads and we get interaction of plants, we can get kind of these hybrid looking plants. So a mix of my tarweed here and my silver sword has actually resulted in a very kind of hybrid looking individual. That's high gene flow, right? Most certainly. Genetic drift is a little bit different. Genetic drift looks at impacts typically on small populations in particular. We've got two types of genetic drift we can go through. One is bottleneck, I mentioned this to you before, and one is founder effect. So you may have trouble distinguishing the two of these. So let's take them one at a time. I've got penguins on an iceberg. Not uncommon, but what I want to focus on is the red penguin. In this population, this large population, I have 1,000 red penguins and 10,000 total penguins, meaning that in my population, 10% of my penguins are red. Got it? Okay. In my small population, not 10 individuals total, one of my individuals is red, but it's still 10% of my population is red, right? One out of 10 is 10%. Which one of these do you think would be more affected by environmental factors or sudden changes? Oh yeah, this small population. We can actually look at the fact that if we kill off half this population, my iceberg breaks, whatever, melts, it's global warming. So when we look at 50% survival in my population here, I've got 450 red guys that make it out of 5,000. 
It's 9%. Yes, 9% is different than 10%. Significantly over time, probably not. But if I look at 50% of my population surviving here, I actually get no survivors that are red. Now, no, you are not going to see red penguins in nature, but what we're using the red for is to indicate changes in a particular allele just by random dumb chance. The red guy was standing on the wrong side of the iceberg. What if this iceberg actually broke so that this side survived? Then one out of five would be red, and we have a 20% red population. Wow. So now in, we've just doubled our percentage of red, right? That can be pretty significant over the long run, can have huge effects on a population. So there are natural occurrences of these bottleneck populations. We see it in seals. We see it in the cheetahs. They're getting, their numbers are very low. And when the numbers in a population are low, we see bottleneck effects like this happen all the time. You can look at this as far as just beads, and, and everyone always puts them in a bottle, right? We're just pouring out a certain number, and by random chance, our surviving population is only purple and green, when originally we also had some orange mixed in. So if you think about these as alleles, what's the possibility that allele is going to make it through a bottleneck event or a, or a minimizing of this population over time? We see these bottleneck effects in nature, like I said. The greater prairie chicken is one that has actually been studied excessively in populations. Um, but <clears throat> what's interesting, they used to number in the millions, but in 1993 they counted 50 prairie chickens in Illinois. So a population that went from numbers on the order of millions to 50 that's a pretty significant bottleneck, right? And they actually looked at the DNA of these surviving chickens, and it showed that they lost more than 30% of the original alleles in the population. So the original variability was decreased more than 30% through this bottleneck. Now that might not seem significant to you, but imagine if the human population lost one-third of its variability. How well do you think we'd survive? Certainly would be a different looking population, wouldn't it? Okay. Founder effect is also a type of genetic drift. So many folks think about this as the opposite of bottleneck. So rather than taking a fixed population and cutting it down, you're now taking select individuals and moving them to a new location that don't that does not have any of those those particular individuals. So we essentially are starting a, a new location for a population with a few number of individuals. So they're founders of a new population, okay? Well, the problem is that by doing this, those small number of individuals that you start a new population with have the only alleles available to that population. Think about picking out 10 of your friends and repopulating the planet. That's kind of scary, right? You'd probably want to do some genetic testing on those friends to make sure that they're fit for this, right? But that doesn't occur. We just start new populations um, with a limited number of individuals. There's actually a Micronesian island where there is a 10% occurrence of total color blindness. We never see that in the US. Okay, and we never see that in the human populations. But what we do see is in these small groups that start populations, we see a lot of these kinds of otherwise very uncommon traits. So take polydactyly in the Amish. What does polydactyly mean? Polydactyly means many fingers or toes, digits. Okay. So what we want to look at is whether or not this population, this founded population, is different from the original. So in my diagram here, we look at the idea that this original population has 33% of a particular allele. 
but we take four individuals and start a new population and by random chance 50 percent of them now have that rare allele this could have huge impacts on this population over the long term right we actually see polydactyly as i mentioned is a very common trait in the amish populations why do you think that would be well if you know anything about the old order amish they actually have a very limited population and tend to not marry outside of their own community. So many of you would refer to this as incestual, but what we look at is this is a founder effect for these particular traits. A few founding individuals of this community had rare alleles. Those rare alleles are now much more prevalent in the new population because it's maintained. We have many individuals expressing those rare alleles, and when they marry, those rare alleles continue to be expressed. And now we have the children inheriting two copies of a recessive gene that can lead to genetic disease. So one other agent that we wanna talk about is something known as non-random mating. So I mentioned to you Random mating is you bump into the next individual of the opposite sex and they're your offspring for the next generation, okay? They will be your partner. But what we want to look at is that sexual selection is strong in natural populations. It's even strong within the human population if you really look at it. But what we typically think about is males competing for females or females being picky about the males that they choose. Something known as intersexual competition looks at the idea that this female has to pick one of these males to mate with. Which one do you think she's gonna pick? Oh yeah, she always picks the big pretty one. Why? strong characteristics such as the the peacock on our right here are an indication of good genes or good genetics strong individuals terrific so the female is going to pick the male that appears to have the better genetics we can also look at something known as intrasexual competition where the males actually compete now, if the males are actually going to compete for females, there has to be some sort of dimorphism between the males and females, meaning they have to look different, okay? So there has to be some sort of phenotypic difference between the males and females. And we see this in all kinds of populations. And many of these males will actually fight to the death for females and the rights to the harem or the breeding, uh, the breeding females of the population. The last agent of microevolution that we want to look at is actually known as natural selection. So natural selection is going to look at the selection for particular traits. And in populations, this typically means that you're favoring some adaptation that makes you more fit. Remember, fitness is survival and reproduction numbers. Okay, so if you want to have high fitness, you have to have high survival and high reproduction. We see this in populations that have strong environmental and predatory pressures. Okay, so we have to have a trait that is beneficial. If you don't have a trait that's beneficial, then it's not going to be maintained in these populations. Let's look at zebras. Okay, so zebras have stripes. That's kind of a given, I think, for you at this point in your life. Um, but the interesting thing about zebra stripes is they've been maintained. People often say, well, they live in an environment where that's striped. Well, okay, but I don't know that a black and white zebra in a brown savanna is really all that camouflaged, right? Well, unless your predator is colorblind. Lions are colorblind. 
and lions are one of the biggest predators of zebras. So a zebra actually blends in quite well as long as he holds still, right? If he starts running around, that's a different story. Folks often ask me, well, does natural selection actually occur in humans, or are humans kind of the outlier for all of these processes? Well, natural selection actually does occur in humans. The biggest place that we see it, or most defined place that we see it, is actually in fertilization. So if we say in our little example here that if a sperm comes into contact with an, with an ova or an egg 100% of the time, so we get some sort of contact. Only 85% of those will actually result in fertilization and the formation of a zygote. Please don't use this as your fertilization slash reproductive strategy, okay? Do not use this as any sort of birth control mechanism, okay? I'm just showing you the numbers. So when we look at 85% fertilization rate, that zygote then has to implant in, in the uterus, right? Well, then we look at only 69% success, okay, for implantation. Viable at the fourth week, we're down to 42%, okay? At the eighth week, 35%. So this would be kind of first trimester, right? And they encourage folks not to talk too much about being pregnant until after their first trimester. This is why you're only actually going to have a viable offspring one-third of the time based on our stats here. 31% will actually still be viable at term and be a strong birth. Wow. What do you think is working at such a strong rate that only 31% of our original sperm plus egg are actually going to result in offspring. Well, it might not surprise you to find out that it's really chromosome problems. So something is going on with the chromosomes that will cause changes and not allow the offspring to actually form properly. And some of them we look at extra chromosomes occur. We have something known as trisomy 21, where we have three copies of chromosome 21. It's a syndrome known as Down syndrome to us. Okay. But only 0.6% are born that have an extra chromosome. These are very small numbers, right? This is certainly natural selection at work. This is a process selecting for traits that are best suited for that, for that population. We'll look more at natural selection as it leads us into macroevolution in the next couple of lectures.